this morning. We are in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, so if you would turn to Ephesians 4. If you would stand for the honor of reading God's Word, uh, we're going to read the first 16 chapters here, and, and, and starting with uh, 16 verses here in chapter 4. Uh, not 16 chapters. That would be a long standing, wouldn't it? I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one also who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until... We all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ." from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray. Lord, we are truly thankful that we have an opportunity to come and just to worship you, to lift up our voices and our hearts to you, Lord. Lord, to be able to give to you, to be able to serve you, Lord, and now to be able to learn from your word. And I pray, God, that you give us ears to hear. Help us, Lord, be the people you've called us to be. Lord, help me to preach plain and clear so plain that a child could understand. I do realize that there is a strict judgment on my life and rightly dividing your word of truth. I do accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray, in his name that I preach. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I remember as a little kid, you know, being so excited to go watch this movie because it was going to be seen in a way that you'd never seen a movie before. Is going to be in 3D. And they gave you these glasses. It was paper and it had a blue lens on one side and a red lens on the other side. How many of y'all remember those 3D glasses? And we were going to go watch Jaws. And uh, for those who may be younger, Jaws, that's a, a movie about a shark. And there's a, a, a scene, you know, when, when Jaws comes up out of the water, whoom, and you're in the 3D, you know, you're eating your popcorn and you're watching it, and then all of a sudden, whoa, you know, it's like the shark is just trying to eat your popcorn, and it's out there in front of your face. And, and the purpose of the 3D movie experience was so that what you were watching just on the screen, it comes out at you and engages you. And is right there in front of your face. As we've been looking through the book of Ephesians in the first three chapters, it's heavily on the doctrine side. It's heavily on the theology. And four through six, we will see it's heavy on the practical side, although there's still some doctrine and theology that Paul is going to be teaching us through it. But all theology, Good theology is not meant to stay upon the pages of the Bible. Good theology is not just to stay in your mind. It's not just something that you are to know. It's something that's supposed to jump out of you, and it's supposed to get out and live in front of people. Theology, right doctrine, is supposed to change how we live. It's supposed to impact our deeds. It's supposed to impact our direction. And so when we talk about theology, when we talk about knowing the Word of God, it's not just to have it on the, vi- the screen of our mind, but it's to jump out at the world and let them see what a man of God looks like, what a woman of God looks like, what a mature believer looks like. And so this morning, in honor of Father's Day, the title message is this, Mature Manhood. 
mature manhood. That we are to grow up in Christ and have mature manhood. Now, manhood is not just for the men. Which it's mature adulthood. Uh, it's to be mature in our faith, that we're no longer babes and infants in our faith. And we're going to develop this mature manhood through 3D living. All right, because it's it's in, in, it's out. It's not just on the page. It's not just in our mind. It's not just something we believe mentally, but our theology and our doctrine is something that we live out practically in our day to day life. And the three Ds we're going to look at are this: we're going to look at our doctrine, our deed, and our direction. Our doctrine and our deeds should influence and direct us in the right path. We have a direction to go into, okay? So that's what we're going to look at this morning. You ready? All right, let's go back and let's start with verse 1 of chapter 4. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner, how? Worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now notice this. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been called into a new life. You've been called by the power of the Holy Spirit to surrender your will to his will. You've been called by the power of the Holy Spirit to die to self to live unto him. And you've been called into a holy calling and you are to live in such a way as to walk worthy of that calling. The calling you have been called into is Christ. You have been called into Christ. We are called Christians. If you are a Christian, it means Christ-like. So if you're going to walk worthy, then you must walk according to who? All right, either you didn't realize that was an actual question, or you went asleep, or we got a lot of teaching to do. If we are Christians, and it means Christ-like, then to walk worthy means to walk like and walk after who? There. I feel a lot better. Walk like Christ. You know, when I was growing up as a kid, and we were going to go on a school trip, or we were going to go out, uh, the church going to take us out uh, as a, for a youth outing. My mom would set me down, and she'd give me the speech. You know the speech. Now, you're about to go on this trip. I'm not going to be around. So don't do anything that will what? Embarrass me. Right? She'd be like, because that's the Kanoi name. Right? That's our name. You're representing the family. Don't go out there and act and, and, and live and act and behave in such a way that you're going to bring embarrassment on the family. And, and that's, that's really that's a, that's a rule for us as believers. Right? We are to live in such a way that we don't bring embarrassment on the name of Jesus. We walk worthy of the calling. Why? Because we're supposed to be mature in our faith. We're supposed to grow up in our faith. We're not supposed to be acting like babies and infants all of our life. We're supposed to grow up into Christ. Amen? All right. So this is our our, our deeds and our doctrine uh, are going to shape our direction and influence our direction. Let's, Let's look at He says, with all humility, verse 2, with all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love. We're going to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's look at some deeds that, that, ex- that would show maturity. Now, I want you to notice these are, these are not characteristics that the world applauds or they celebrate. Humility. You know, uh, we, we teach people to have pride and to be proud and to do what they need to do. But humility is, is something that we as believers are called to possess and to live out. And, and let's understand what that means. Humility doesn't mean self-abasement. It doesn't mean to say, oh, I'm just horrible, I'm just bad, and, you know, false humility. You know, because a lot of times people say, oh, I'm, just, I'm just not good at that. I just can't do. Really what they're doing is they're wanting the next person to say, 
oh, no, you're great at that. You're wonderful at that. No, so not false humility. Humility means this, to see yourself as God sees you with infinite and inherent value, but with no more value than anyone else. To not think that you're better than someone. It means being willing to accept God as the authority over your life rather than insisting on being your own supreme authority. Humility. To serve one another, not thinking I'm better than this person. Not showing favoritism because of who this person is and how much this person makes, but being humble enough to see that Every person is valuable in God's sight. Humility. Gentleness. Some of your translations use the word meekness. Again, gentleness is not uh, one of those attributes that we try to aspire. You know, we think of manhood, you know, because we think of strength and strong and be able to fight and be able to, you know, we don't think of gentleness. But what does gentleness mean? Meekness mean gentleness or meekness means power under control. Power under control. The war horses in the ancient world, they went into battle and they were trained to protect their master. They were under total control of the rider, and the war horses were described at that time period as being meek. Their strength was in total control. We need that, don't we? Uh, Men, you need that. A lot of times, men can be angry. They can can be full of of, of wrath, and, and they can let their power, their strength, or their aggression to get out of control. Uh, we see this often in domestic disputes. We, we see it when you're at work and you just, you know, we call it sometimes just flying off the handle, right? You're just flying off, and you just go and you don't have your strength under control. If we're going to be mature, we, we have strength, but it's harnessed. We have control over that. And then we have patience. Patience is waiting on God's timetable. It's Letting God work out the things that need to be worked out when God wants to work that out. And boy, is that, that's so easy, isn't it? Huh? <laughs> no, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? To, to wait on God's timing and, and to be patient. And, and uh, you know, if you want more patience, just let me give you some pastoral counseling. Do not pray for it. Because the Bible says tribulation brings forth patience. Trials brings forth patience. And so when you're in in the midst of a trial, a hardship, uh, you're learning patience. Waiting. It's hard because we want the answer to be resolved right then, right now. All right? Now, let's think about this. Humility, meekness, or gentleness, and patience. And then he says... uh, Uh, to bear with one another in love, bear with one another in love, uh, because he's talking to a church, he's talking to a church, and as a church, we need to be humble, we need not think that we're better than anyone else, we need to have our, our strength under control, we need to be patient with one another, bearing with one another, or we could say it this way, putting up with one another. Have you all put up with, uh, hey, let me just ask the dads right now, hey, Aren't you glad sometimes your wife can put up with you? Huh? And, and don't you have to put up with your spouse sometimes? Don't you, uh, parents, don't we have to put up with our kids sometimes? I mean, we have to bear with one another, and we have to be patient with one another, and we have to be gentle with one another, and we have to have humility with one another, because though we're growing to mature manhood, we don't get there instantly. Right? It takes time. And not everybody's going to get it right all the time. We still mess up. How many of y'all still mess up? How many of y'all still say things you shouldn't say? You think things you shouldn't think. You do things you shouldn't do. We all still stumble and fall, and we've got to be patient with one another. 
The problem we get into is when we, you know, we start looking at people and we're going, I can't believe he does this. I can't believe she did this. I can't believe he said this. And, and we start doing all of this stuff and we got to wait, wait a minute now. Uh, man, God's patient with us. And sometimes people are patient with me. And, and guess what? I got to be patient with other people because we as believers sometimes, we still trip and fall and get ourselves in the pig pen sometimes. Now here's the difference between a believer and a non-believer. A believer won't stay in that pig pen. A believer will get up and say, nah, uh-uh, no, this isn't where I'm supposed to be living. And when somebody falls in a pig pen, what do we do? We patiently love them, and we try to get them back to maturity and growing in grace. Amen? These are our deeds. This is how we are to live. This is how we are to treat one another uh, as fellow believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Because our theology isn't just to be on a printed page. It's supposed to get into us to live out there and impact how we, how we actually live. It's 3D living. Our, our doctrine impacts our deeds. and gives us the direction of what harmony and unity says to protect the bond of peace. To protect the bond of peace. To be the unity of the, the bond of peace. Unity. To be unified. What's it mean to be unified? It means to be together going in the same direction, moving in power, right? And, and so when we started this church 20 years ago, we said we're going to center on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. We are going to make everything we do about people coming to faith in Jesus. And let's center around that. Let's be unified around that Jesus is the only way to heaven and that people need a saving relationship with Christ. And apart from him, they have no hope. So we want to we try to lead as many people to Jesus. We want to be focused in that. And when you're focused and unified, boy, great powerful things can happen, can it? Water, when it's concentrated, can be very powerful, can it not? Right? Any of y'all wash your car at the, at the wash stations, you know, where they have the spray gun, pressure gun, right? Well, you know, when I was in high school, they, they started making those where you could bomb and you could have your own pressure washer at home, you know? Wash your car with pressure, you know? Um, my dad got one. And I thought, well, you know, I get to wash my car with a pressure washer. I had a Dodge Daytona. It was white. It had an orange pinstripe down the side. I love that car. It was the coolest car, wasn't it, Michelle? I mean, she just, when she saw me driving through Moorhead in that car, she thought, oh, who is that guy? I mean. And and so you know I I wash I got that I got the spray gun out right the spray gun is, it, it, it's focused pressure of water right and I'm sitting there I'm going to wash this beauty up and I go to spray it <laughs> my pinstripe went away <laughs> I was like that water just shot that thing right off because there's power you know when something is concentrated. When we as a church, when, when, when we know our doctrine, when we are centered and we know our faith and we know what we believe in and we focus on what Christ and who he is and we lead all people to Jesus and we're all trying to lead people to Jesus, man, powerful things happen, amen? He goes next to some, some doctrine. He reminds us here, uh, of, of our unity, what are we unity in the bond of peace here? We're going to notice the Trinity here in verses 4, 5, and 6. He says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. There's one body. There's one church. Yeah, there's many local churches. But there is one universal church that's invisible. Like, there's churches that are meeting all over right now. And then there's lo in local assemblies. But we're all part of the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And we're, each local church is a part of that body. Then each individual person is also a member of that body. And we're united by one spirit. That spirit should be capitalized in your Bible. That's the Holy Spirit. There's one spirit of the Lord that holds all things together. It's the Holy Spirit of God who comes to live and dwell in the hearts of believers. 
right? There's one, and there's one hope. There's one hope. We as believers have a common hope. And our hope is this. That this is not all there is. That there is, there is a day when Jesus is going to return. And he's going to come and he's going to make all things new. The dead in Christ will rise. Those who remain will be caught up to be with him. And so we shall ever be. And he will set up a kingdom that has no end. All evil, all wickedness will be destroyed. It will be cast out. It will be no more. There will be no more suffering, death, disease. And we will live and reign under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And we will be his people forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. That is the hope. That's the common hope of, of Christians, of believers in Jesus. Uh, the promise that was made to us by the Holy Spirit, who was the guarantee and down payment of that future hope that will come. And then he says there in verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Lord. That's, the, that's Jesus, right? So we have the Spirit, we have Jesus. One Lord Jesus, there is one name under heaven where men must be saved. And that's the name of who? There's no other way. There's no other path. There's one way to the Father, and that's through the Son. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. He doesn't say, I am a way. I am a lot. He said, I am the way. It's through him and through him only. He is, there's one Lord. There's one faith, faith in the Lord Jesus of who he is. And there's one baptism. There's one experience that we all as believers get to experience. And we saw that this morning. These two who profess their faith through believers' baptism. Now, baptism isn't what saves us. It's our faith in Jesus that does that uh, by his grace. But, man, it's the one common experience that we as believers get to experience. Man, it demonstrates the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as we're baptized into him, into his name, under his authority, to say that we are followers of Jesus, right? Now, baptism is important, and we, we love to do baptism. If you are a believer, there's sometimes when people have maybe grown up in a church and they weren't explained the meaning of baptism or they didn't get connected into a church and so they, they become Christians and, and they never get baptized. They're, they're believers in Jesus. They've given their heart and life to Jesus. They, they love him, but, but maybe they've never been baptized. And that might be some of you this morning. And if that is, you just say, hey, it's time for me to do that, to identify with the body of believers and to declare my faith through believers' baptism to say that I'm not ashamed to be a follower of Jesus. And you do that through believers' baptism. Not like the many washings that the Jewish culture had. No, just one. The baptism of saying, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Buried in Jesus. Raised in Jesus. Amen? And then he says, and one Father. Right? Look at it. One God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. There we are. There's the Trinity there. The Spirit, the Son, the Father. There is one Father. One God, one Father. He is Lord over all. Okay? Uh, dads, we got to know our doctrine. Men, you got to know your doctrine. Ladies, we got to know our doctrine. Church, we got to grow up. We got to know what we believe. Amen? We got to know what we believe because that impacts how we behave. Verse 7, but, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. And like, what's, what's this talking about? Well, um, there's a couple thoughts that theologians have on this, and I like both of them, so I'm going to say amen to both of them. And the one obvious one is this, that it's speaking of, and it definitely means at least this, is that it's talking about the, the, when, when Jesus humbled himself and took on the form of flesh, God becoming man, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, he was in the beginning with God, verse 14, John 1. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. So God became flesh, Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. 
And, 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 and so God became flesh. So Jesus, the virgin birth of Mary, and he lived a sinless, perfect life. And on the cross of Calvary, so he, he descended from heaven, lived a perfect, sinless life, died for our sin, took our punishment on the cross, bore our sin, became sin on our behalf. Not that he sinned, but he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He bore our sin on the cross. He died. Why did he die? Why did he have to die? Because the wages of sin is death. So he took our penalty of death. He died. They put him in the tomb, and he rose again and ascended back to the Father in heaven. Amen? And, and so that is the, is the gospel. There's other passages, too, that also maybe insinuate that when he was dead in those three days, that he, uh, he descended into the lower realms of Sheol, where the dead were awaiting in the Old Testament time. They were looking forward to the Messiah. And the thought is that he, he preached the good news to the captives there and said, hey, all of those of you who are looking for me, I am he. And he released the captives and brought them back into the paradise unto God with him. And so he forever reigns. And I say, amen. Because what it's speaking of is the victory of Jesus on the cross. That he came down, accomplished what he set to accomplish, that he, he died for our sins according to Scripture, and then he went back to the Father where he sits at the right hand of God. That's a position of power and authority where he rules and he reigns. And we worship him. Amen. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so he goes on and he says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Now, why are you doing works of ministry, and why is the body of Christ being built up? We're doing this until we attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to what? Mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In Ephesians, he talks about that everything that we have has been laid upon by the apostles and the prophets. Uh, Peter does the same thing. That our faith is, the, the foundation of our faith is given to us by the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, right? What are the apostles and the prophets? It's the word of God. It's the inspired word of God that came to us through the apostles giving us the New Testament. And it's the prophets of God who gave us the inspiration, inspired word of the Old Testament. Everything that we believe is grounded upon the Word of God, God's inspired Word, centered on Christ. That's how we grow up into mature manhood. we got to know the Word of God. we got to know what the, the foundation is that the apostles and prophets laid for us. And then there's evangelists that take this Word, and they go throughout all of the world, and they begin preaching and declaring the good news of Jesus. And there's pastors and teachers who are, are put in place uh, to oversee uh, the church so that the church may grow up into maturity, so that the church may build up for works of ministry and building up of the body. Now, we teach this in our classes. We have our class 101 and through 401 classes, we teach this, is that, um, that John and and. And our main job uh, as pastors here is not for us to do all the ministry, you know. For, for one, we can't do everything that Living Water Church does, right? I mean, we're good, but we're not that good, right? I mean, we can't do it. Like, we, the impact that Living Water Church has made, we would not be able to make that if it wasn't for the building up of the saints for the work of the ministry. Who are the saints? You all. And you all are, we try to build you up for the work of the ministry. That's why we try to uh, make sure that you know what, what to believe through the preached word of God, through sound biblical teaching. That, that you grow up in your faith through discipleship. Uh, that you serve the kingdom through understanding your shape. And then that you go out and you try to invite people to Jesus by uh, knowing how to share the gospel. And so 
what, when, when we all come together and we all become the part of the body that God's gifted us to become, then we, we, we work very well. Like your body, when everything's working good, that's good, isn't it? Like Matt, like you're getting a new body, right? Like he's get, he got a new foot, he's getting a new, new knee, he's getting a new hip, you know? So, you know, you're going to be playing on the softball team soon, right? Basketball, exactly. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to see, he's just going to become a new man. But when you have every part of your body working, when it's healthy, man, your body works well, doesn't it? But we have different parts that make up our body, right? We have an eye, but our whole body's not an eye, right? If our whole body was an eye, we would see a lot, but we wouldn't do much, would we? It takes many different parts of our body and for us to function. Every member has a different part, and when we all come together and, 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 and play the position that God has gifted us to play, man, great things happen for the kingdom. Amen? The unity of the body. When we as a church are patient with each other, when we, are, uh, we live and walk in humility, when we ha- walk in meekness, we walk in patience, man, God begins to shape and mature not only you individually, but a church together collectively into mature manhood. We as a church, we as a church are, going, we're 20 years old now as a church, right? Uh, so we're getting into adulthood. Yeah, young adulthood as a church, but it's still adulthood. And we as a church are to grow up and mature, and that happens as each one of us grows and matures. You with me? Our doctrine and our deeds direct us into unity for the good of the gospel. So, now we grow up into maturehood, and the purpose of that, look at verse 14, is so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Right? We, we can't be children just tossed around. Why? Because we have a doctrine that is grounded in the Word of God. We are building our house on the rock. Amen? We're building on the rock, so when the winds come and the rains come, it's not going to blow us over. We're going to have our doctrine solid. Now, even in Paul's day, there were false teachers who would come behind him and try to distort the gospel. Some of those were known as early Gnostics. Gnosticism was a spiritualized form of belief that they had special knowledge into the things of God and they tried to separate the material and the spiritual and, and they'd come and confuse believers. And, and we've got to know what we believe. Dads, you've got to know what you believe and you've got to be able to teach your kids what to believe about the Word of God. You've got to build your foundation on the rock of Jesus Christ. I had a young man come up to me several weeks ago and uh, was asking me uh, about this particular Bible study group that he was invited to go to. It was on a college campus, and, and man, it was, uh, well, it's a cult is what it is. It is a false religion that was started out of South Korea, and it's called World Mission Society Church of God. And uh, here's on their website, here's some things that they say. Now, God prophesied that he would appear a second time on this earth for the salvation of humankind. Okay? Not sounding so unusual. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will, prepare, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Okay? So far, this sounds you know, pretty solid with what we would believe. According to this prophecy, God appeared as a man a second time. Christ Han Song Ong humbly served us, sacrificing himself for our salvation, just as he did at his first coming. Y'all pick up something weird there? (laughs) Okay, because if you didn't, like we're starting a Bible study tomorrow. Like, (laughs) Christ Han Song Ong, that... That Jesus came back and said, you know, and, and here's what they'll do. And here's, here's what they'll do. They'll, they'll, get, they'll get these 
they'll get you in a Bible study, they'll call it a Bible study, and they'll go, everything that you've heard about the Bible or you've been taught about the Bible is wrong. And you're like, huh, wow, gosh, I didn't know that. You know, my, my preacher, you know, he, he, could be, he could be lying to me. He could be wrong about some things. I mean, he don't sound too smart when he preaches anyway, so I mean, he, he, could, he could be wrong. Uh, and they start making you doubt. I'd warn you, I warn you on YouTube, watch out for the YouTube stuff. I mean, there's so many things about YouTube that try to make you doubt Orthodox Christianity. <coughs> Basic Bible beliefs that's been around for 2,000 years. Suddenly someone else this, uh, got a new insight into something. Be careful. Watch what you listen to. Be careful. You have to know the Bible. We have false churches out there, right? Like Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness. They deny the Trinity. They're not Christian. Uh... Mormonism was, it was found in 1820 by Joseph Smith, who got a revelation from an angel of golden tablets in Egyptian writing that only he could read. Does that sound a little funny to you? I've got a revelation from God that only I can understand. And you have to listen to what I say. Does that sound a little crazy to you? It better. That ain't the Bible. I love the reason why, I mean, the, the, the Bible is so, it's so, it's so great because it wasn't written just by one person that has God as its author. But it has several men who's wrote this, who's penned this, over 1,500 years on three different continents, and it's all messaging the same thing. Only God does that. And it's not in some hidden thing where somebody couldn't understand it, and they had to be told by one person what it all meant. No, it was written in the, the day of their language, Hebrew and, and parts of Aramaic in the Old Testament and in Greek in the New Testament. Why? Because they spoke Hebrew and they spoke Greek. It wasn't in some uh, this different language that, that they just got this clue on. we got to know what we believe. You can't be swayed. I remember when we lived on Pines on Main. Uh, we'd have we'd, we'd have uh, those two groups. They'd come and, and they'd they knock on everybody's door. Well, well, one particular group they were leaving literature on everybody's house, and so I was sitting there watching them. I thought, man, I ain't letting this happen on my block, you know. This ain't happening on my block. We ain't getting we ain't getting this th these these lies on there. And so as they as they went this way, as they circled around, I went behind them, and I just started taking all the literature <laughs> off of the door. That they had left, I said. I said, we're we're not going to let this this be distributed up in this neighborhood. Um, you got to know what you believe. Jesus died according to Scripture. He is a hundred percent man, hundred percent God, hundred percent of the time. He is the Word made flesh. He is not a man who became God. He is God who became man. He is not a God. He is the God. He is the Lord. He is the, the one who died and rose again. And our salvation is in him and him alone. We got to know that. We got to believe that. We got to grow up into that. We've got to, if somebody comes to us and starting trying to teach us uh, false things and we got additional books to the Bible and you've got to know this and you've got to do this, you got to say, whoa, wait a minute. Nope, nope, no, no, no. The Bible says, by grace have you been saved through faith. It is not of works. It is a gift of God so that no man can boast. Nope. My faith is in Jesus. My faith is in the finished work of Christ. And I'm building my life on the rock of Jesus Christ. Man, you got to build your house on the rock. Amen. Fathers, you got to build your house on the rock. You got to build your house on the truth of who Jesus is. Your doctrine matters because it impacts how you live out your faith. Your deeds follow that. And it determines the direction of your life. And our direction is to go and honor and walk in a manner worthy of our call calling. He says here, verse 13, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. We are to speak the truth in love. Now, we're not to be hateful, meanful. We're not to be uh, belittling, but we are to be truthful. There is truth and there is love.
Jesus died for my sin, for your sin. There's no other God that did that. The answer for the world is who? Jesus. We speak the name of who? Jesus. We speak the truth of who? We lead people to who? Because he's the Savior of all. He died to save sinners. And the Bible says that we've all sinned and fall short of glory. All of us are sinners. So everybody needs who? Jesus. And so we go preach Jesus. And we do that, and we, we, we try to preach Jesus all the way through Montgomery County, right? And when we're all unified and we're talking about Jesus, when we all leave this place and we go to our homes and we go to our communities that we live in, we take who with us? Jesus. And we preach Jesus. We share Jesus. We live Jesus. It impacts Montgomery County. We got all kinds of people here in Montgomery County, and we're trying to share Jesus with people. We got folks in Clark County that come to this church, and we got so we, we got some some influence there in Clark County as they as they go and try to live and, and share and talk about who. We got some people in Menifee County that are part of this church. And they go on to Menifee County. Got some in Fleming County. There's some folks in Bath County. We have folks in Breathitt County. And then someone chimed in and and in, uh, in, uh, in first service and hey it's okay it, they're from Wolf County and, 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 and we got folks in Wolf County uh, I've, have Fleming County have a Fayette County oh, yeah in Fayette County it's spread out to Fayette County and it's like man look at all of the counties that are being influenced right here and let's just keep taking it out because the more we start sharing the more we start inviting the more impact that we make for the kingdom of God. And we got to know what we believe. Our doctrine's got to be steady. Our deeds have got to, they've got to, they got to back up what we say we believe. We got to live out our faith. And the direction we go is to honor Jesus in all that we do, to walk worthy. Because I don't know about you, I'm going to build my house on the rock. Dad, you're going to build your house on the rock? Moms, you're going to build your house on the rock? Let's build our house on the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and may he be glorified. Amen. If you need to know Jesus as Lord and Savior this morning, we're going to have a time of invitation. We're going to ask you to come and say, I need to be saved. If you need to be baptized, if you say, I've, I've been a Christian for a while and I've never, I've never been baptized. I need to be baptized. You come and let us know that. You just want to come and pray, you're going to come and pray. Men, towards the end, as we wrap up the service, I want all dads to start coming down. We're going to have our, our annual toast that we have and we're going to, we're going to celebrate fatherhood, okay? So let's, let's bow our heads as we come to our close of our invitation. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your love and kindness and that you humbled yourself so that we might be redeemed that you took on flesh and you bore our sin and you bore our shame and and Jesus you, you rose again defeated hell and death in the grave and we worship you today we celebrate you today and Lord help us to grow up in you help us to mature Lord, I pray for all the fathers in the house, Lord, that you would just uh, make it their heart's desire to, to, to be grounded in your word. May they grow up in you. That the mothers, that, the, that, that just everyone in our church, God, we would mature into, into Christ. So, Lord, speak, move, do your bidding in Jesus' name. Amen.